Hello, hello, everybody. Today, we are going to be going over some of the fundamentals for prenatal yoga. Um, by no means is this a comprehensive <clears throat> training, but hopefully some guidance to give you some tips in the direction of what we want to do and some common contraindications, things we don't want to do, especially in the first and second trimester. <clears throat> Many people feel that the third trimester is the trickiest part to teach yoga. To be honest, that first trimester is more crucial than the other two as far as safety with yoga postures. Uh, one tip we wanna keep in mind is we do not want the arms to go overhead in the first trimester because it elongates the uterus and could potentially result in loss of, of pregnancy. So these are some common things that people don't know when they're thinking about going to yoga when they found out the good news that they're expecting and they go into a warrior one and things like this. So I hope that this is of community service to anybody who gets a chance to watch this video and understand that it's for informational purposes only. Um, as my guide, this is my Bible for this particular program. Um, Iyengar is <clears throat> very well known and his daughter, Gita, uh, carried on yoga throughout her entire pregnancy and was even in headstand, I think when she's just about to deliver full term. So it can be done, uh, but let's make sure that we do it in a way that the benefits outweigh the risks. So today, Haley is going to be demonstrating to give us a hand and show us some stuff. She's going to have a big belly on just to see if we can throw off her center of gravity a little bit. Um, Haley's balance is very, very strong in her personal practice. So it will be fun to see how this experiences changes her perspective on what yoga asana might be like for an expected mama. Uh, we will get into, as time allows, some meditation techniques and a little bit of pranayama work that would be fitting and appropriate for uh, expected mama to be. So I hope that you stick around and get an idea about how we can serve this highly underserved community. And so we will be doing that soon. All right, Haley. I'm going to publish this to Facebook. Oh, God. So our fun friends there, prenatal yoga. can see what we are up to. Preparing the live stream, setting up the meeting for Facebook Live. Remember it was AOL, it was like 20 to 40 minutes. Yeah. Do you or did I just date myself? <laughs> Okay, let's do it. All right, folks, prenatal yoga teacher training in effect. I've got Haley here willing to demo. You've got a big belly coming. Yeah, should I put it on? Yeah, we'll, yeah. we'll, get, that, we'll get that put on. So put that on your t-shirt and then get the strap and uh, use that strap to secure it so it stays put. Uh, I like a D-ring strap in general, as far as just yoga straps go uh, versus the plastic clip. I think that that one's a lot better. Uh, so hopefully you guys will have a little fun seeing some of the basics around prenatal yoga and some of the things that we can learn for our expected mamas to be. Um, <clears throat> I had mentioned once before, but if you haven't had a chance yet, to pick up this book, Iyengar Yoga for Motherhood by Gita Iyengar. This is the one I would say that uh, she would be the expert in her field on this topic. Uh, while many of these postures in this book might be considered somewhat advanced, and that's a word I don't use lightly, um, I would recommend that we consider make sure every asana that the benefits outweigh the risks. So that's kind of what we're up to. How's your fake belly going? <laughs> you know, isn't that part of mamahood? Like what, you know, we, we yeah. right now we throw on a t-shirt and then all of a sudden mamahood comes in and everything gets changed around and we've got belts and straps and what are those little swather things, the swath things to hold the baby and so on. So we'll get that going and let's hope Haley's ball doesn't go flying in the middle of this slide. But hey, if it does, it does, right? Because that's what life is about. Um, okay, so while you do that, 
I will be going over this book with you guys. Um, in your workbooks, you guys want to open up to the page of prenatal yoga, if you haven't already. For those of you enrolled in the 200-hour or the 300-hour course, open up your workbook to that page, and this will uh, satiate that part of the syllabus there. Um, okay, so one thing that I really love about this particular book is the way it's laid out. And so I'll just kind of go through that a little bit. And that'll also be a preview of some of the things that we'll be going over um, in today. So we incorporate some of the ideas, the eight limbs of yoga in prenatal yoga as well. Uh, I think a, a big piece of that moving outside of the asana is how do we, how do we implement something like um, pratyahara withdrawal of the senses so that moving away from some of the discomfort that we might experience during a pregnancy, for example. Uh, how do we integrate calming pranayama and breath work so that we can find some stillness and some centering? Maybe, maybe if life is chaotic, maybe even after the baby's born, life will definitely be chaotic at that point. So those are things to consider that we'll go over a little bit. Um, we'll go over some general rules and guidelines and things along those lines. And then as far as a postures go, and this is where Haley will jump in, is we'll demonstrate some standing asana with some common props that can be used for it, some seated asanas, some forward bends, some twists, some inversions, some asana for the abdomen and the lumbar, a back bend. How do we do it? And when is it okay? some restorative asana. And I, and I was telling Haley before this class that prenatal yoga makes for the best restorative yoga class in the world. Like it could be the same exact class, just change the name of it on the schedule from prenatal yoga to restorative yoga. And the reason for that is because we're so mindful getting into the postures. We hang out there for a long time. We pull out a number of props so that we can support the mamas to be. And then we take all time to like slowly move out of those postures. And that's really, I think, the, the nuts and bolts of a strong restorative yoga class. So if you are thinking about taking prenatal yoga, but maybe that's not your dam or you're a little afraid to do that just yet, it makes for a great restorative yoga as well. Uh, so there's that. Uh, so a couple of breathing techniques. We won't go terribly deep into this because we don't have a limited amount of time. Uh, we, we would want to consider though, when do benefits outweigh the risks in pranayama just as we would in asana. So, you know, while there's something we can do, that doesn't mean that that might be of benefit to us to, to do these things. Um, a couple of pregnant uh, problems in pregnancy. I won't go deeply into these because I'll honor the scope of practice as a yoga teacher per the Yoga Alliance guidelines. But if any of these buzzwords apply to you, then definitely make sure you connect with your doctor and see what they advise as far as that goes. Uh, so our buzzwords of the day, dilated cervix is something, prematurely dilated cervix, uh, dizziness, fatigue, which again, how much fatigue, uh, and headache are some things we want to keep an eye on. If we're having, we're having those things, we want to talk to our medical care uh, team, whoever that is for you. Uh, high blood pressure impacts not only prenatal yoga, but yoga asana in general. There's a number of yoga asana that are contraindicated with blood, high blood pressure. So those are things to, to keep an eye on. Low blood pressure tends to be move a little bit more slowly out of postures or out of inversions to, to solve that. Not in all cases, but the high blood pressure has its own set of uh, rules and things to watch. Um, diabetes movement is really, really good for diabetes and commonly people will prescribe yoga for diabetes and that's wonderful. Just make sure that you include your medical team in on your plan in the choices that you make on your mat. Um, Tension, heartburn, and shortness of breath all can be indicators of something bigger going on. And so we want to keep an eye on those things as well. Back pain, which to a degree, of course, you know, could be normal, but it could be something that uh, might be a little bit more severe. So when you're, when you're at your regular checkups with your physician, make sure that you talk to them about, you know, this is what I'm experiencing and, and follow their guidelines as such. Uh, I would say prenatal yoga, the, the key thing is oftentimes 
I'll have folks uh, call Edge and say, oh, do you have any prenatal yoga classes? I just found out I'm expecting, to which I say, congratulations, and we throw confetti. But then after that, have you done yoga before would be the first question, because that might not be the best time to start a new discipline. Do you know many, many folks might come to yoga in an effort to manage their weight gain uh, throughout their pregnancy, things along these lines, um, maybe manage their stress um, or even maybe their flexibility and they're changing bodies. And as Haley will be demonstrating the asana, when we change our center of gravity by throwing a little ball in our belly area, then we definitely change up um, the experience of how we move in life. And that's not just on the yoga mat, that's getting in and out of the car, that's going up and down the stairs and things along those lines. So those are some key things that we're going to want to go over and we'll want to cover and we'll see how far we get in this little mini, mini info for you. Um, if you have this book, uh, then head on over to page two of it. If not, I recommend you order it because even if you do not specialize in prenatal yoga and you're a yoga teacher, it is quite likely that at some point a student will walk in and, and share with you, great news, I just found out I'm expecting. And it's really helpful to have some key basic fundamental knowledge of, of what prenatal yoga is and how it differs from some of the other styles of yoga. Uh, so when we think about this, going back to Patanjali and what he brings to, to a yoga practice, I would recommend that we consider these same things during a pregnancy in order to enhance the experience and have it as blissful and joyful as possible for not only mama, but those in her circle as well. So the first one of the eight limbs of yoga is yama. And it is, is spoken here, is conduct towards other and self-discipline. So if we think about our interplay with other people, what it sounds like, how it's going, how to improve that, some basic guidelines in life and things like that. I think one thing that that yoga personally for me has served me more than anything else has been the the choices between, for example, when to tell the truth and when to observe non-harming and what those look like. So the first order of business in Yama is ahimsa and that's non-harming and that comes before truth, which translates from Sanskrit to satya. So when you are trying to decide, should I tell my expected mama to be if she looks like she's putting on weight and if that might hurt her feelings, then according to the eight limbs of yoga, you might wanna maybe perhaps suggest a, a really nice shop for clothing for your expected mama to be instead of saying, yeah, it looks like you put on a few, take the pickles out of my hand, which I will admit uh, when I was expecting my young son, who's now 27, uh, they had to pry the pickles out of my hand to have that happen. And I was hitting up Taco Bell three times a day. So there's a little bit of that. How do we balance the truth with the non-harming and how do, we, how do we know what comes first? So non-harming comes first, first order of business. So hopefully that, can help you in life as well as in this program. Um, the second matter is niyamas, and it's the conduct towards oneself in individual discipline. So this is our, our work within the things we do. So some things that I found, and I'll just share my experience with you, some things I found is I would put so much on my schedule that it would be really hard for me to keep up with my commitments, whether they be, you know, arriving on time or not canceling or not changing my schedule and things like that. And I started to see that I think maybe what I could benefit from are some strong boundaries on when to say no and when to say maybe at another time and observe what I need so that I can, I can come forward, um, with the best job I can do on the things that I do accept. And so that's, you know, that's my, my thing that I'm doing. And I invite you to maybe spend some time journaling on what your thing is, and what you're doing and how you can benefit from a little bit of self-study, which is in Sanskrit, um, Svadhyaya, that's a good one. Okay, Asana is practice of postures for physical discipline. We'll have Haley demo with our ball on that one. And sometimes people get a little mixed up. They think of yoga, that it's just asana. And then also sometimes people say that, well, this isn't really yoga we're practicing. It's just exercise. And I would disagree. And that I feel that 
yoga is set apart from the other exercise modalities of which I, I offer and I train on many in that it's really a breath centered approach. And it's more of a um, guidelines of how we live in our, our life in general um, versus hitting the scale. So these are kind of different things. Although I would say any exercise in its own right would serve stress levels, concentration, better sleep, overall health, perhaps more confidence, and then with it, better relationships with others, which might also impact, you know, personal confidence and how you feel about yourself. So there's that. Although I would say that yoga holds on a platform where those ideas are the emphasis of why we do it. So the why is different. Um, so that's a big thing. Um, some people do ask, why yoga is different than Pilates or how it's different. And I have studied both. My roots are in Pilates even before yoga, but with Pilates, the movements, the asana are core based. And so the idea that Joseph Pilates had when he was aiding injured soldiers in rehab was if we can strengthen the core, then we can end up with a healthy body different from yoga, which is a breath centered approach. So we're going to breathe through movements. And that's where the pranayama piece is probably as much or even more yoga than the postures themselves standing alone. Uh, so those are some ideas. So pranayama is breath control for mental discipline. Sometimes what we need to do is just take a long, single centering breath. And in practice, we might find the monkeys of the mind start to dissipate a little bit and it becomes a little easier to zoom in and, and think about what the task at hand that's in front of us and maybe perhaps less overwhelm as a result of those things. Uh, Pratyahara, we chit chatted about this one. This one's really great for prenatal yoga as a withdrawal or discipline of the senses. So commonly the example I give is I get cold. I don't like to be cold. I like to be warm. My environments are warm. I own 90 coats, my heat's on 73 or my air is too. But at a certain point, it can distract from my experiences and life in general. So can I maybe find a way not to put so much attention and focus on the fact that I'm a smidge chilly and just, you know, perhaps can concentrate on the task at hand or whatever else is going on in life. So um, that's a really, really beneficial one, I think for all. Uh, next up is dharana and that's concentration. So this might be what you see in a yoga class after the asana practice, when we lie down in shavasana or corpse pose, uh, face up supine. And we walk our practitioners through like a body scan, a yoga nidra, a guided meditation, um, this would still work under music with a gong, sound bowls, reading from a book. I had a trainee once read the Harry Potter series. It was really nice. But the idea is it's not truly meditation at that point. It's concentrating. We're, we're teaching our practitioners how to concentrate on an idea so that the monkeys of the mind can be tamed and we can focus on that breath work. And so that differs from dhyana, which is actually true meditation. Now here we don't shut off the mind is sometimes folks have thought. It's more about opening up yourself to be receptive, to receive what it is you need, whatever that might be. Some folks might connect that to receiving, you know, um, an awareness around something, uh, receiving stillness, whatever, whatever it is for you that day on the mat. And it is meant to change and evolve over time. Last one, Samadhi in the book is listed as self-realization. Uh, depending on what lineage you follow and who your gurus are and what your personal belief systems are, samadhi can be any number of things. It is commonly attached with the idea of connecting with God. And you know, going back to Patanjali and when these eight limbs of yoga were laid out and the purpose of these, of these steps would be to connect with God. So that's definitely, that was the end game. Although I would say in any discipline, it's lovely to see somebody personalize it in a way that really works for them. So those are just some of the key things that I wouldn't want to leave out of the uh, prenatal yoga segment and make sure that they find their way into your classes um, in, in some way or another. So the first thing we're going to do if we go to page 17 in the book, it goes through preparing for pregnancy. So prenatal yoga practice can actually begin 
long before conception actually takes place. And so preparing the body by strengthening the pelvic floor, by helping to relieve stress, by inviting, um, inviting useful hormones that might encourage pregnancy can all be very helpful for the practitioner aiming to get pregnant. So those are some things that we can think about. So we're going to bring Haley in now and um, you've got your ball on. Are, are we nice? <laughs> are we good? Yeah. All right. And if you can just like to grab our own or let me know that I should probably put that there. All right. So you have a bolster. Mm -hmm. You have a blanket. I'm going to give you a second strap since your strap is currently being used, <laughs> right? And then you have a ball. And um, Mary, would you grab two blocks for Haley? Uh, fun facts on blocks, particularly in prenatal yoga. This is not a time to skimp off blocks to get, you know, the thinner blocks. Make sure your blocks are at least four inches uh, wide and nice and sturdy. I have heard great things about the cork blocks, so that might work for you too. But just make sure whatever prop you use is a nice, strong prop. And if we get as far as integrating a chair in today's practice, then that can be fun too. But make sure that chair is on a steady, steady service and will not go flying. So that's really important. Um, okay. So now that you have your belly on, we'll play around a little bit with preparing for pregnancy. So let's start off with one number eight here. And as you can see, I want you to keep your feet on, on the bolster, unlike in the picture, and get the blocks to either corner of your mat. And before inviting your heels up to it, Maybe start off into a staff pose with your feet coming forward with your feet nice and flat and just find a little bit of movement, right? Finding a little softness in the breath, allowing the shoulders to send back and down and release. And you can join on in as well. Finding that heart center open, I think is a great cue for this and that it reminds us to sit up nice and tall and find our posture there find our centering breath. Perhaps invite hands to heart center and take an intention for today's class with the eyes closed. What is it that you would like to get out of class today? If nothing comes to mind, I invite you perhaps for it to be self-acceptance, allowing your practice to be where it is today and honoring that space and time. So from here, float your hands down alongside you and we will aim to bring the feet towards the, the blocks, but not quite on the blocks yet. So one foot alongside a block and another side of block. And you might find just as you naturally did that you're inching and scooching mm -hmm. on the bolster. I feel the bolster is really helpful to elevate those hips. Do you find it to be a little less awkward having the hips up this way? Oh, yeah. This definitely helps. Yeah, I'm a big fan of it. It's mm -hmm. in every one of my. <laughs> and Michelle's easy yoga class, come see me. All right, um, so from here, maybe let's just play around and do some point and flex with the feet. So making a connection where we're pointing and flexing the feet, engaging some of the muscles in the lower leg complex, which in many cases are underdeveloped and can quite likely increase the chance of falling. And particularly with a pregnant practitioner, we want to make sure we have a nice steady sound step. So that's one thing that I feel that is really, really helpful. I feel it also helps the practitioner reconnect with that high hand eye foot coordination and just find mindfulness and just get into the groove of moving a little bit, finding some warmth. Um, maybe bring your hands together in prayer and float those feet. And this time, hold into a flex foot as you invite the toes towards the nose and the heels away from the body. Can we keep a softness through the knees and engage the front of the thighs there? Once there, can we lengthen the spine, send the shoulders down, find that opening up through the chest? And this is relevant because in pregnancy, the breasts enlarge and become very, very tender. And so there's a tendency to want to round, round those shoulders forward. And here we want to be mindful to keep our posture upright just as we would in any other class. Uh, notice I did not cue to bring your hands overhead 
And as I mentioned earlier, and I'll probably say it again and again and again, is we don't want to bring the hands overhead in the first trimester because it elongates the uterus and there's a greater uh, um, chance of detachment and resulting in loss of pregnancy. So this is something so many folks don't know that I hope to educate the, the planet along the way. So hands to prayer is a great one to go. Palms together at heart center if that verbiage works for you better. Uh, maybe from there, invite the hands down alongside the body and then back to prayer and move through this cycle and find a breath movement here. Maybe we inhale to heart center and exhale towards the earth. And just take maybe five or 10 of these, allowing the breath to move through you, keeping a mindfulness about what's happening with that lumbar spine. Is it wanting to round? It's still nice and lengthened, right? Which really by keeping the feet flexed, it helps that. It helps us engage our course. That's one of the little tricks of the trade I picked up along the way. When done, invite your hands to the sides of the bolster and hold on to them. And we are going to invite an opening of the chest and move into inviting heels to the blocks. So before we go to the most advanced level of this movement, we'll take the blocks and put them just either under the knees or under the thighs. And for each of you, explore where that block wants to comfortably go. And then from that place, after a few breath center movements, we'll see where do we want the blocks? Will the blocks eventually make their way down to be under the heel or not? And that there's no right or wrong answer in that question. So keeping a nice softness in the knee, as you've demonstrated, having these blocks under the calves absolutely does that, keeps us supported. I would say that there's an unbalance work here that your core would probably be engaged right now. Do you have some engagement yes, going absolutely. on? Does it feel a little different? Like mm -hmm. I've got you off the floor. You're not as yeah. grounded and steady as you're accustomed to being. I have to engage my core more to keep my spine straight when I have my legs lifted like this. Exactly, exactly. So we want a nice strong core and we want that to start at the base so we have a nice strong pelvic floor. Mm -hmm. But we do not want to accomplish this through sit-ups in pregnancy. Mm -hmm. No sit-ups in pregnancy. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now that I've said that in the full trainer we go into more about that. Take a few minutes and return your hands back to heart center once again. Close your eyes. Return to your intention that you set at the onset of class. So cycling back, what do you want from today's practice? And maybe it's changed a little, maybe it's grown. Maybe it's the same as it was. Maybe you forgot what that was and you're on to a whole nother new one and that's still fine. Now let's go back to our, our breath work where we're dropping our hands down on the exhale and floating them back on the inhale. And let's roll through these five or 10 or so. And just find a soft liquid movement in this place. And as we do, maybe some of the other things that were happening in our mind's eye, there's not as much space for that, right? And what's one of the beautiful things about those balancing postures? They keep us present. <laughs> and we'll do a couple more of those. Invite the hands to heart center. Close the eyes and find the softness. So how do we feel here? Do we feel happy here? Relax. Excellent. Um, okay, then from here, uh, and this one is under preparing for pregnancy. If you, if you have picked up this book on page 17 and make sure you read her disclaimers at the front of it as well. Um, okay, so the next one that we're going to move into, this book is organized by trimesters. Uh, and we can see different ways of it being done. And I will show you uh, how we can change up these different things that we're going to be doing here. So we're going to build on what you've got here with this strap. And since we have these trusty bars here, we will integrate this for prenatal yoga. So making sure any prop that you choose to use in any yoga class, particularly in a premium or perhaps senior class, is nice and sound and strong and sturdy. Okay, so here, if you would want to reach the strap with the hands here and the hands here. Okay, so 
adding layers. So much like restorative yoga class, the amount of time it took us to get you this far, it wouldn't make a ton of sense to move you out of this and have you do something else instead. One modification that I would offer my students early on is at any time, feel free to bring the feet off of the blocks mm -hmm. or maybe even return the feet to staff post or dindasana or bend at the knees or mm -hmm. soles of the feet on the floor, whatever it is you need. And hopefully as you look out to your class, everybody's doing something just a mm -hmm. little bit different. So that's, that's how we want that to go. Uh, okay, so can we find a goddess pose in this? So those nice bowl post arms. Mm -hmm. This will require you to inch and scoot your hands up towards the mat in order, or towards the, the strap in order to use its resistance. So yeah, inch and scoot and inch and scoot and inch and scoot. Yes. How's that feel? Feels good. Right? Activating the upper body now. So what, what shift do we have from before? to the use of the strap in gold post arms because i know you, you've integrated gold mm -hmm. post arms in many of your classes with edge long way with the strap we're drawing the shoulder blades back together now yeah the mm -hmm. shoulder blades want to come back mm -hmm. and again going back to the breast enlargement there's mm -hmm. nothing that's going to embarrass me i will educate you so uh, <laughs> to the best of my abilities anyway i will share the learning experience you might find deeper into the pregnancy mm -hmm. that this is very uncomfortable, mm -hmm. you know, or you might find that it's absolutely delightful mm -hmm. in exactly what you need. Uh, so again, being mindful of, you know, if you don't have all of these, if you don't happen to have bars on the wall at home, you might have to get a little crafty as to what it looks like. I like that you chose to bring the feet together. Mm -hmm. And then now we can take change our attention away from the balance aspect mm -hmm. of it to the opening in the upper body aspect of it, which is something we definitely want to keep in mind. Um, why don't you invite the soles of the feet to the ground and bend at the knees to anchor yourself a little bit further mm -hmm. and see if you can inch your hands up that strap some more and just deepen that stretch a little mm -hmm. And that might mean that you scoot yourself forward or back on, on that mm -hmm. bolster a little bit, knowing the adjustment's worth it because we're gonna be here for a time, which in a class like Vinyasa Flow, that wouldn't necessarily be the case because we're continually moving, whether it be slow flow or fast flow. Uh, here, here we're holding out there for a little bit. Okay, what if you kept your hands where they were and invite the soles of the feet together and allow the knees to fall open? Do you feel supported and secure here? It's a little hard. It's, a, it's yeah. harder than you would think. So without the belly and without the strap and without the bolster, how would this posture experience normally be for you? My knees would be able to fall open more. Yeah. And my hip flexors maybe I release a little bit. Right now I feel tight through the glutes and hip flexors and the pulling. Right. Back, yeah. So could you see maybe a newfound, if not already, understanding about how practitioners that mm -hmm. come to your class, whether it be prenatal or restorative or any any of your mm -hmm. classes with, with tighter hips and things like mm -hmm. that might experience this posture mm -hmm. and why we might not label as easy. Right. Exactly. <laughs> even just even just sitting here with the belly, my new belly, it's a bit more of a challenge in the hip flexors and the low back is all of a sudden like, Ooh. yeah, it's a whole nother day. Yeah. And so I think it's important to at least understand and experience these things a little bit more. And I'm going to be giving you a chair to offer up some support mm -hmm. here in a bit. So that'll be nice too. So why don't you go ahead and release the, uh, the strap and invite the hands back to prayer and take a few more of those breath movements where we're flowing through, dropping the hands down on the exhale and inviting them up on the inhale, returning once again to that pranayama work, where we inhale and we press that. I will be going to go get you guys some chair. So we can go to the use of chair in yoga. I also have to say there's no weight or stand in this ball. It's just 
air. So it's giving you a great appreciation of what it's like to carry weight in front of your body. So, right? Yeah. Yeah, you're exactly right about that. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm saying. And it's a whole other thing. I think it could be both of ones out of here. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be a big step up. Yeah. <laughs> okay, you got it. Uh, all right. So, yeah, I think we have and invite heart, uh, hands to heart center, close your eyes, reconnect once again. So, okay, for your chair, chairs can go sliding. So there's nothing more important than making sure that the props that you choose are nice and steady. No prop is better than an unstable prop. And I say that in yoga, prenatal or elsewhere, but particularly we don't want our mama or even like our silver super sprout flipping. So that's just paramount. So I am going to offer up my personal mat for the chair. And I feel like that's a little bit more professional to do because even if your practitioners say it's okay to use uh, their mat and put a chair on top of it, it's not sensitive. Right? And then, you know, it's hard to say no to your instructor, particularly in a group setting. So we want to be mindful. So here's your chair here. Thank you. You're welcome. Can I just make sure? There we go. And now we get the chair for you to walk. And feel free to just take it out and get yourself a little bit comfortable. And we can put it in that seat. Contact my ear. Okay, so this is a great sensation to do. If you want, want to move your whole position up, you'll stay where you are immediately uh, or possibly shift if you want to it. Um, okay, so what we're going to be looking for here is for you just to rest your hands here in this chair. So I got these nice sturdy chairs. This is the way to go. It is not a folded chair. Uh, if you want to bring your bolster up closer so that you can take this posture. And you might find that you want to keep the soles of the feet together. You might find that you might want to free the feet in another way. Or you might even want to take a, a mini seated squat by inviting the soles of the feet to the mat. If you do that, keep in mind that part of pregnancy includes releases of hormones that increases our overall flexibility. And so what happens is prenatal yoga students will come to yoga excited about their newfound uh, flexibility that maybe their connective tissue isn't really ready for. And so we have a greater chance of tear and injury because of that. So just because the flexibility exists due to these hormones, doesn't mean that we should take a uh, more seasoned or advanced posture in the, in, within the movement. Uh, how does that feel for you? Feels really nice. I'm so glad you feel supported. Yes, I do. So you would wanna keep the chair here, but if you wanted to scooch forward or back, you mm -hmm. most certainly could. Mm -hmm. And if you wanted to gaze down and close your mm -hmm. eyes and just take quiet, or it's also a nice social time, right? So if you, if you embed enough of these kind of things in your class and let your mm -hmm. mamas hang out here and give them different things to do, let's say we've even set them up in a circle or close enough to each other where they can have that sangha, that community, that can oftentimes be a big of gift as anything mm -hmm. else that you offer them. Right, um, especially this day and age where so many people, you know, are tethered to the computer all day. Maybe they don't have that big of a support system or just the sisterhood that exists uh, within within the sangha. So I like to build in postures like these where I can just set them free and I can stop talking for a moment and they can chatter amongst themselves. Mm -hmm. Right, so that's important to do. Um, one thing that I, I caution against within yoga teacher training is any any, any, any current events, no current events is allowed in Michelle's yoga teacher training mm -hmm. because different people feel different ways. And commonly this can polarize your audience rather than the effort of bringing them together in the sangha that we're looking for. So uh, everybody has a right to feel the way they do, whatever that might mean. Um, so no, no current events and that might mean that you have to uh, 
to do a little run in on a conversation heading and bring it back into another direction if that should happen. Mm -hmm. The next thing we want to consider is this would not be an appropriate time to bring up personal um, events that could potentially trigger another student. Mm -hmm. And so I'll give an example of let's say we have a student in class and a conversation erupts and uh, you can move in through and out and however you need to move to remain comfortable while I ramble on <laughs> this idea. We might have a student that wants to share, let's say about a loss of pregnancy. They want to share. And there's a place for that. That would be like a sister circle. That would be a workshop. That would be that would be in the description of the class that we'll be talking about personal matters and such. So people know what they're signing up for. And the reason I say it is that the person speaking might be completely comfortable with the topic, but there could be people in the room where that could trigger them and be quite devastating for them and so on. Uh, many times I try and teach an all levels prenatal yoga class, which largely breaks down to anything in this book that the benefits outweigh the risk within the second trimester is kind of the baseline. And then letting your first trimester uh, mamas know we don't want the arms to go above head. So if we cue that and keep your hands to heart center, for example, there's a, there's a few like little go-tos that you can accomplish that. And your third trimester mamas might be a little closer to just keep yourself comfortable and thanks for coming, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Holding that ahimsa, non-harming, that, that negative self-talk that sometimes comes up, especially towards the end where we don't look and feel the way we once mm -hmm. did, you know, which was, has a number of different impacts. Um, so, okay, so in this seated, um, is there any part, you've been sitting for some time, is there any part that you're starting to feel any discomfort in this, in this asana? And if so, where? And what could you do to shift that up if so? Um, for me, the, the biggest area of discomfort is probably my back from along the spine root to my shoulders, maybe. Yeah. But I'm really trying to find a, a flat back because, I mean, you have that tendency to want to round or yeah. I'm really trying to find that flat spine to keep it safe and protected. Finding that yeah. spot. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think that a, a great answer to that in, in a class, whether it be private mm -hmm. session, prenatal yoga is a great setting for in-home instruction, mm -hmm. especially for the mom of it is kind of tethered to home and, and can't get out of their home. Mm -hmm. At least then they have some some community as well as the asana. Mm -hmm. And so with that, I would say, um, continue to, to move the bolster and take your time to find mm -hmm. that sweet spot and reinforcing that self-care is worth taking time and attention to get into mm -hmm. and out of, which could be the gift in itself, right? Mm -hmm. Like you're worth that. If you want to move your bolster or if you want to scooch forward or back, take that time to do that and keep that in mind when the little ones are growing up into teenagers, <laughs> right? So you can go ahead and come out of that now. Uh, okay, so now I'll demonstrate in this book here, it's page 71, if you guys have the book in front of you, um, where now we would probably wanna bring the bolster forward, but we're gonna flip the chair around and return to the posture that we saw before. And see where the legs want to go in regards to the blocks while honoring how the body feels. So I think the, the big thing that I love about prenatal yoga is I was I was um, apprehensive to teach this. I actually had my good friend Gamadi teach this first because it's quite a bit of responsibility, mm -hmm. you know. But I think that if we have an underserved community of mamas to be that have no idea what the right things are to do there's not enough teachers to teach them mm -hmm. um you know there, there becomes i was called to learn some of these basics and then once i got a hold of this book i thought well this isn't necessarily hard there's some of these that i might you might not find me doing mm -hmm. personally that would be in my practice mm -hmm. uh, but really what we have is one stinking yummy restorative yoga class could you mm -hmm. see that oh yeah yeah that opening that one thing mm -hmm. um i would even say you could find a um, seated yin class in this in that at edge we don't teach a conventional yin a conventional yin moves the body out of anatomical alignment with the intention of lengthening and stretching the connective tissue to increase the flexibility and while that might serve some in my personal opinion i feel a hybrid class 
that keeps the body in alignment, but still holds the posture for a longer time. So those connective tissues can experience a more permanent lengthening is the bigger gift and the benefits outweigh the risk. And that's just my own personal views and mm -hmm. everyone gets to choose them. Um, so you're here, um, we will be doing this one against the wall when mm -hmm. I turn you around in a moment. Uh, so here against the chair, how are you feeling now when you're in your lumbar back? You're not reaching quite as far, mm -hmm. uh, but you've been holding your body up for some time. Yeah. You've got this weird belly thing attached <laughs> to you. Yeah. <laughs> what is your experience in this posture right here? I think just sitting upright on the bolster now with the belly and my back has just been, I've been feeling it the whole time. Okay. Okay. Which I'm thinking like also you can come and put yourself up against the wall too or put a bolster vertically. Yes. There on the wall if your back is hurting to support that area. And that's exactly what we would do. Mm -hmm. And that's a great opportunity to do that. Um, one thing as teachers we want to keep in mind is whether or not the student wants the chair on their mat. Because I know this is an yeah. expensive mat. It will mm -hmm. be dense once done. Yeah. Um, so what I would do if my practitioner had said that, I would offer that modification that you've given. Mm -hmm. um, and I would say, is it okay if I put my mat on top of your mat or my mat you know, instead, mm -hmm. right? So it's my mat that's going to be the one with the chair on it. Mm -hmm. Unless they're like, really, no, I want to use my mat and I'm fine with dense and everybody yeah. agrees in which case the student gets to choose. Yeah. Uh, one thing I would invite you to do is bend the knees and, and bring the soles of the feet to the earth. How did that change your experience? Well, that allows me to find a, a longer spine, I would say. Yeah. I'm going to place my soles of the feet, bend my knees straight up to the ceiling that might can really lengthen through this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And maybe even if you brought your hands a little closer to your body and towards mm -hmm. the edge of the chair, so you're still using it to support mm -hmm. without the cumbersome move the chair a million times. And even in chair yoga, which is seen, I think, in corporate settings is on the rise. Mm -hmm. A number of corporations have a wellness program. They're bringing yoga instructors in and things like that. Mm -hmm. And these are the resources, you know, available yeah. to us. We're not going to be bringing bolsters and such into an office mm -hmm. setting, but they probably have a chair. They might have a chair with wheels. And how do we feel about a chair with wheels? Uh, no. no chair is better than a chair with wheels unless it is pressed up against the wall, in which case we're going to turn things around. I'm going to show you that here in a moment. Uh, okay, so here we're going for this now. So I'm going to turn you around and your feet are going to go towards the wall. Mm -hmm. I'm going to put the blocks there just so that your, well, you've got pretty long legs. Maybe mm -hmm. I'll have the blocks in your body and we'll decide if those blocks are right for you or not. Mm -hmm. And you're going to hold on to the strap once again. Mm -hmm. So the chair, just for the sake of continuity, I'll move it out of the space, but I won't totally take it away. Mm -hmm. And I'll invite you to turn it around a little bit. And before we go into any additional props, I would just like you to take some seated cat cows, do some simple breath work, reset the body as we inhale and exhale, throwing those arms up and down as is comfortable, feeling that opening in the hips, knowing that if those hips are feeling tight, that maybe you might want to invite the knees together, the soles of the feet to the earth and free that up. It's also a little bit more accessible if the feet are further away from the body than it is when the feet are close to the body. So those are some things to keep in mind as you move through this. And take a few moments of that. Also, remind, remind um, the practitioners that there's plenty of opportunities to use the bathroom and to water as, as desired. And to most certainly, there's no need to ask to use the restroom. This is an announcement I would make early on in the class. So for those of you that need to use the restroom at any time or get up or whatever it is you need to do, other than check your cell phone or stay <laughs> out of Shavasana, which I won't allow. <laughs> right? then we can do it that way too. Uh, all right, so while you take these, before we move into our standing posture and our little fake bellies that we have going, invite your soles of your feet to the wall. And so based on where your bolster is, you might finally want to evolve using the um, block 
then you might find you don't. It can be nice to use the block in that it offers something to push the feet against. So let's give it a go. Scoochie back. And really, really take your time here to move in through this. And the first order of the business is where we've taken our seat. So we're a little back comfortable. Do we need to move forward or back on the bolster? Is the shoulder still open? Taking a moment to open up the toes nice and wide and create a little space in between each, each toe, allowing the toes to have their own independent little life. Oh, nice toe expansion. Beautiful, very good. Maybe even wiggle each toe. Can you imagine this though? We're wiggling one toe at a time. So as we go through this invitation to move with our toes, this is actually an opportunity to practice Dharana's concentration. We're giving our mind something to do, moving it away from the daily tasks at hand and all the things that we need to do and finding a nice center breath, inhaling and exhaling. General movements with a belly at hand generally need a little bit of air around them, props are nice. Maybe we wanna take a nice malasana or squat in the day, in the edge of the seat, relax into it. And from here, Haley, what if you reached for that strap there? We can open it up so it's a, a bit more centered for you. Let me do that for you. Yeah, there you go. Now are we good here? Good, good, good. Okay, fantastic. All right, so from here, can we find that same goddess pose that we saw before? So moving the child away. And can we invite through a hymns and on harmony that nice softness in the lumbar spine? Now imagine the breasts are deeper into the pregnancy and are soft and tender. How would you maybe change this up? Could you invite the elbows a little closer to each other and take a more forgiving goddess? We relax into the shoulders or maybe even invite the hands in front of the body and use the strap for a little additional support forward. How does that feel for you? Feels really good. Feels really good. How is it different? Now I'll repeat that just so the camera can hear you. Uh, <laughs> you're doing a great job. No big twists. No big, no big, no big twists. And um in prenatal yoga. How is this different than your chair experience? Um, well, I'm higher up with my arms here. Then the chair wasn't kind of stressing. Just my arms were parallel with the floor. Okay, so arms can go a bit higher. So I can bring my arms up here. Uh -huh. Do we feel an elongation within the uterus? Does the belly feel like it's being stretched up and down? Yes. Okay, so then we would want to invite our so, hands lower until that yeah. was no longer the case. So yeah. that would be a cue to offer up yeah. your practitioners that is, is I think, a little bit more accessible than an elongation of the uterus. Mm -hmm. Like, wait, what? What, is, what does that mean to me? Mm -hmm. And we do that as teachers so often. We get a hold of the lingo, and we know what it is, and we're excited about sharing it. But that might not be a lingo or a language truly that your practitioners know and understand. Mm -hmm. So tell me about the experience with your feet against the block in regard to what's happening in the back of the legs. What do we have there? I feel like the back of my legs are and maybe just more activated with the action of me pushing into the block. So more activation mm -hmm. behind the legs with the action of you pressing into the block. Mm -hmm. Before we put the block there, you were doing it against the wall. How did that differ? Mm -hmm. I think it just made it more accessible for me because, I mean, I guess if I scooch my bolster back into the block. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Making it more accessible to mm -hmm. you by bringing the wall to you. And mm -hmm. one reason that's beneficial is if we had moved the bolster towards the wall, you wouldn't have the room to work your, your mm -hmm. hands as freely as you now do, mm -hmm. right? And I think that that's a lot to ask of any practitioner to have hands and feet both on the wall, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and I think that in all probability, 
it might be at, at the expense of the low back or maybe discomfort in the hips and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing is, is we can ditch the block at any time. There are advancements in this book where we start to see things like the feet on top of the blocks. I'm not going to carry you through that practice mm -hmm. because I don't know that the benefits outweigh the risk or the reason that we might do such things. What I do feel though is in regards to having short hamstrings, and I think I thread this in every one of my trainings, is that we want to lengthen the back of the thighs to relieve some of the low back pain and or pressure. And this is a great isolated movement in order to do that. And you know, when we learn about isometric movement, where we find a posture and we hang out there, we hold there for a time. Those are some benefits that we might yield in a in a restorative yoga class or a yin hybrid class or even a yin class if, if that's where you go elsewhere, right? Mm -hmm. That you would not yield those same benefits in a vinyasa flow because that would be a different experience. Mm -hmm. And not to say that you couldn't achieve it coming in through the side door. However, it would be in a, a different way and mm -hmm. holding the posture for a longer period of time. Just the general consensus of how to gain flexibility. Mm -hmm. So that, those are some things that we can keep in mind. This is also a really good one for bodybuilders. So if you have a gym and they have some sort of structure on the wall, commonly they do, this is a nice one to do. Uh, okay, so we're gonna play around a little bit from here. I'm gonna build a, um, a ramp for you behind you. So I know, so you're gonna get some relaxation. Mm -hmm. So let me go get the... Uh, blocks to do it and teach you the things. There you are. I'm going to put these blocks all the way up at the top of the mat. Okay. And for you here, it's a great time to take a little sip of water if you'd like. We're going to use the same bolster. You can come on off that bolster. And I'm going to take your mat and I'm going to change the direction of the mat. I'm going to do this for you as a mom. And this will give you a chance just to get up, get off the floor for a bit. Feel free to maybe go use the restroom or get some water, chit chat, or, mm -hmm. or anything like this. So in prenatal yoga, spoil your mamas and be the one to do it for them. So I think that that's just a nice, nice way to do that. If they don't want you to do that, then we hold space and honor that as well. So, okay, so I'm doing this now. So to build the ramp, what we do is we take two blocks and nice sturdy blocks. This is not a time to get chintzy blocks <laughs> from the dollar store, right? Four inches minimum. Uh, the cork ones are nice as well, but I like these. Uh, I think these clean nicer mm -hmm. as far as a community block. Mm -hmm. But if you're buying your own block for your own practice, then I probably would get the cork. Mm -hmm. All right. So then from here, we can pay for it, but they'll last forever. You want to think about where you're putting the, the bolster in relationship to the block. My bolster right now is about two blocks away from the sideways block, and it's going to go right here. Mm -hmm. And now we're going to do some good stuff. Mm -hmm. So if you want to come on back over and have a seat right here, you want your hips to land right on the edge. You're going to face the wall right on the edge of this bolster and slowly milky put yourself down. And if you're not exactly in a place where you can hang out for all time, then I want you to inch and scoot your way closer or further until you are. How's that feel? Really nice. Isn't that lovely? <laughs> like, this is not a good one for after finals. Oh, yeah. This is my gift to you. Thank you for downloading. You may have a bolster <laughs> to bring home with you so that you can bring it back to school. Oh, well, no, you're graduating now. How about that? Yeah. Okay, how do we feel over here? Oh, I'm so wet. I don't want you to feel abandoned or I'm loved over here. Um, okay, so now what we want to do is moving back through our trusty book. What we have is something very similar to as demonstrated on page 71, and this is called resting with a bench. So if you have, let's say, um, if you have a bench or an ottoman at home and you, you bring that up against the wall, not as the model, but you get someone to help you and have that up against the wall, then you could probably get some really big pillows. Haley, in your YouTube channel, haven't you had people like get big pillows from their sofa and yeah. get bed pillows, body pillows, things yeah. like that? Or maybe take two uh, pillows from your bed and use a strap and tie them together even. 
Excellent. Two pillows from your bed, use a strap and tie them together. And that works too. Uh, okay, so just whatever you do, you want to make sure that you are very well supported. Do you feel very well supported or do you feel wobbly at all? I feel very well supported. Oh, I'm so glad. Okay, she now that she has confirmed that she feels nice and supported, we're going to allow you to do whatever you like with your feet. Mm -hmm. You might find the soles of the feet on the mat feels good for some grounding. You might find dropping your knees together and the feet towards the edge of the mat supported. You might find the legs out in front of you, whether they be straight or with the toes and insoles rolled out. Just really kind of inch and scoot your way into whatever posture feels nice to you. And know that you can change those legs at any time. Uh, this could be an opportunity to use the strap um, in a class, and we would get that into that in probably in, in live training or or on another one of these workshops that we do because well you know you look pretty comfy right now and so I'm just gonna I'm gonna leave you be where you are <laughs> all right so now let's decide on the arms and how this posture can benefit that posture that we were talking about and that relaxation through the shoulders so you've done exactly what I had hoped to do you allow your arms just to fall how does that feel different than when we were keeping them alongside you moments ago so I open my palms up Yes. And before I was pushing my hands into the earth, palms side down. And when I like let my arms go, open the palms up, my shoulders automatically drop down. So by moving the hands from face down, where we were pressing into the earth, to rolling open, supine, face up, prone, face down, supine, face up, it opened up her shoulders and relaxed through the shoulders. Did you feel a softness occur through the base of the neck when you did that? Yes. Oh, I'm so glad. Uh, okay, so this one, this is page 71, and we really haven't moved um, beyond page 69 to 71. These are just two pages, really, that can be a nice sequence, and we've gone an hour on this, and we haven't even seen a Shavasana yet, mm -hmm. or perhaps if you, if you pair your class, the first hour could be Asana, and the second hour with maybe a five-minute break in between could be a sister circle. Mm -hmm. where we then take our, our bolsters and we put them in the circle and we have a sangha and that sense of community. So um, that's really beneficial for our mamas to have that support and to be able to talk and make those connections. Um, again, when the conversations get a little more personal in nature, I usually have like little, little cards that I hand out so that people can easily share their personal information with each other before the class. That would be part of something that I, I have prepared and ready to go and encourage my mamas to do. Um, and I would also, uh, at the onset of the sister circle, establish a short list of guidelines mm -hmm. that can easily be remembered. And so a long list is hard to keep up with a large group. And if you've trained with me in the past, you know, I've got a short list, but I do make sure they're honored. So one thing that would make the list of my circle sister, a uh, sister circle is at any time you can get up and feel free to go use the restroom or if you need to leave, you know, feel free to, to leave. Um, if there's an emergency that arises, I ask that all cell phones turn off or at least muted and face down. So you might have a mama say, I cannot um, turn off my cell phone. I have a three month old at home. I need to be here. I want to be here, but I have to keep an eye on my phone. Then we can hold space for that by having the phone face up, but be silent and just uh, ask that it not um, be used excessively for emergency purposes only. This is the bigger gift to your practitioner that tends to want to use their phone than anybody else in the room anyway. Uh, so I go over phone usage and distractions, and that comes part of our yamas, that social interactions with one another, respecting and holding space for the experience. Uh, the next piece of the sister circle, I would usually include something for them to journal on and pen. Um, I have gotten at the dollar store, nice little journals, they're cute as can be, and, um, and a pen and hold space for them just to, you know, brain them, put their thoughts down and then take that with them when they go, right? Um, I have seen sister circles where they go around taking turns and they choose whether or not they do or they don't want to share. If that is the case, I generally recommend that be a separate example and not reading what they wrote, but rather writing separately an intention, a call to action, you know, a brain dump, a general idea, a sentence of thought. Uh, otherwise, practitioners may find themselves reading something that they didn't realize how personal and or triggering for themselves or those in their sister circle it might be. 
Uh, okay, so from here, after the sister circle was over, then we could take some time to uh, do some sort of activity. And there's any normal number of them. This could be in a sound bowl um, kind of thing, a gong. Um, recently, I've been doing more and more with painting. What I've done, you know, for years is I've picked up those mandala coloring books and I have coloring pencils like laying all over the studio I do and just having kind of a moving meditation where we can just open up space and allow our mind of us just to chat and again experience that sangha but with a structured activity for those that maybe aren't up for talking as much and I think there's less social pressure to do so if we've passed out coloring pencils and mandala and this is what we're doing some might talk some might not talk some might talk the whole time and others not at all. And uh, just trying to moderate that so that one person isn't doing all of the talking. And I'm usually that person where I have to pull myself back, which, you know, through my self-studies, through my niyamas, I realized that I might be excited about what I'm saying here, but am I holding space for others to chime in as well? So we all, we all have our own work to do and that's to be embraced. Um, okay, so from here, you guys get to chill out. Uh, if you go to page 169, if you decide to order this book, there is a checklist and I'm gonna hand it over to you for you to take a look. But I'm not just gonna give you this heavy book and then it's important <laughs> to hold it. And there's a checklist of which postures are appropriate. Notice how few are appropriate in the first versus the second or the third. Wow. Would you have thought so? No, I would not have thought so. Yes. And I will say quite sensitively as I can, it still convey a message at the same time. Um, most loss of pregnancy occur in the first trimester because there's some key basic fundamental things that folks just don't know. And that might be uh, putting away laundry on the top shelf in the closet while it's arms overhead. So if they're coming to prenatal yoga, they're less likely to do that because they've learned about that. Um, okay, so most of the checks on the second trimester and the third trimester are fitting and appropriate for the postures within this book. So these are the standing ones. Now I want to show you the difference. So here, mm -hmm. and again, I'm holding, supporting the weight of the book. Look at the difference between that idea and the sitting idea. Yeah. yeah. So many more seated postures mm -hmm. are okay for your mama mm -hmm. in all three trimesters. Mm -hmm. So that means that it would make sense to, until you're more seasoned in leading prenatal yoga classes, um, stick with seated asana first, mm -hmm. right? That takes care of half the problem. So there's only a couple here uh, where it's, it's not acceptable for the seated asanas. And I think the seated asanas translates nicely to a really great restorative yoga class. What I have done in the past uh, with my own personal prenatal classes or any of my trainees coming in is I put it on the schedule as restorative. And then I let my mama know that this class is listed as a restorative, but it's prenatal friendly. So maybe I have a prenatal friendly in the description. Mm -hmm. um, and then have a separate side conversation with my mama to make sure that they know that there's some key things that we're going to want to do. Um, but because I know it's prenatal friendly, I have instructed the instructors not to have the arms go overhead. Mm -hmm. So since I know that, and then also there's not going to be anything that looks like sit-ups, any, any severe extreme back bends, such as like bridges, wheels, none of those mm -hmm. would be appropriate naturally. Uh, a lot of it is, is truly things that, how would that probably feel with a big belly in front? Mm -hmm. or a new a new growing belly that wasn't there before as you have now. Mm -hmm. Like you said, it's, it's not that it's heavier weighted, but it's there and it's kind of thrown off of it, mm -hmm. right? So there's also a piece of it as we get used to the different movements of the body. Many mamas experience a sudden growth in the belly around the second trimester, where all of a sudden we went from, oh my God, I got this cute little baby bump, so it's hard to move, right? And then by the third trimester, well, then we're getting crafty, but we also have a little bit of experience um, behind us as well. Uh, as you look through these checklists, I'll let you just hang out and be comfy since you work so hard for me. Uh, forward bends are, are good. A number of them are accepted here. 
Um, inversions, I think that while Gita Iyengar is a fan of them, her father most certainly is not. And so for those of you that don't know, um, Iyengar was adamant about not doing inversions, um, either during a menstrual cycle or during pregnancy. And then Gita Iyengar shows up and does a full on photo shoot, uh, headstand in her third trimester about to blow. So I would love to have them there at the family holiday mm -hmm. conversation, <laughs> <laughs> right? And it just goes to say, we have two experts in our field saying different things. And so ultimately we must, must, must choose what's right for us and know what's right for us. In the end, um, I yield, I yield to, um, benefits outweigh the risks. Uh, twists are good, uh, but if there's any history of a miscarriage ever, uh, to be avoided, and uh, particularly in your first trimester. But a soft, gentle opening supported twist that just opens the spine a bit, I think is, is the route I personally would take. Uh, okay, so when we think about <clears throat> asanas for our core, our abdomen and our lumbar, Throughout this, you said, boy, my back really works. Mm -hmm. And we want that. We want, we want like a strength training opportunity for our back to work, but mm -hmm. we don't want to send home achy mamas that don't want to come back next week either. Right? So have it being a loving, you know, gentle environment. Um, in this list, the majority of the back bends are contraindicated in the first trimester and then start to open up in the second. And I believe are unrealistic for most in the third. So the third is, hey, just come take your mat and you can take you know, uh, Shavasana the whole time. And a word on that, notice that I have you on this ramp. This is intentional. In prenatal yoga, we do not want to lay on the ground for any period of time, really more than a moment or so, um, because one, the pressure of the baby in regards to important things going on within the body having to do with blood flow. So I'll get into the why on another day, but the what is prenatal yoga, you need to put them on the ramp. And this is such a nice place to go. It's so nice that I think I just do it for everybody, for every class I've taught mm -hmm. for a long time. Isn't this great? Can you yeah. just chill here? I guess. <laughs> I know. Three hours. Sometimes, Give me a book and I'm here. All yeah, time. sometimes I'm like, I'm going to go to, I'm gonna go to the studio and do some yoga in the yeah. sun. You know, this yoga mm -hmm. helps. Uh, restorative asanas is listed within this book. Um, I think is the most comprehensive list between the first, the second, and the third trimester of you know, equally ex acceptable, um, generally, generally speaking, not contraindicated things. Uh, the rope asanas, many of which, uh, which we demonstrated with the bar and the belt, um, many of which are contraindicated in the first trimester. So no rope asanas in the first, starting to bring them in the second and the third, but as instructors being mindful of, you know, sensitive breast tissue that may be you know, we want to make sure that we've anchored their body where anytime they could let go of a rope or in this case, a strap and them still be fully supported, right? So we don't want any body weight holding on for dear life for that asana. Uh, next up, pranayama is largely what we see here is third, third, trimester, third trimester is most forgiving and first and second is kind of neck and neck as far as what goes. But what's always okay, well, I shouldn't say always okay, but generally speaking, ujjayi breath can, is the way to go. So regardless of who your audience is, nine times out of 10, that Darth Vader breath where you, you bring the breath back and you soften the back of the throat, make that, that if you put a mirror in front of your mouth, it would fog it on the exhale, for example. That's a nice go-to if you're not sure, if you're like, you told me so much, I can't remember, ujjayi breath is nice. Or as we did in this practice today, we just did some nice seated floats and the arms didn't fall overhead, which was nice too. And having that centered breath work is so, so important um, and can really benefit mama on her big day. So can we do some pranayama and can we, can we develop some of that um, pratyahara, the withdrawal, from senses when those contraction starts to come up? Can we integrate the breath work there? Have we built a nice strong pel uh, pelvic floor, which will actually uh, encourage or um, speed up or make for a smoother delivery? There we go. It's like I have a lawyer on my mm -hmm. right shoulder, right? And then the knowledge on the left and I have to discern those. Um, a strong pelvic floor aids in delivery. 
So that's really, really strong. How are we feeling inside? Have we done our own internal work? So maybe that, you know, fear or anxiety is it taking over the joy of the moment? And how is the social interplay? You know, it's helpful when you're, you have a nice relationship with your nurses on your own. So those are some key things that we can keep in mind. Um, some have said that they're able to find meditation and even samadhi bliss during the process of labor. And if we can lay that groundwork for our mamas to be in class long before her big day, then she arrives at the hospital or wherever she chooses to have her baby prepared with as many tools as possible. So that's that one. Um, that brings us to page 172. So if I do a part two of this book, it would be from that point forward, touching on some of the key things. Um, this book was designed for um, expecting mamas to practice at home on their own. Although I would say that there's about three quarters of the postures within this book that I would not recommend that I would re recommend a more accessible version of. And so with that, I do hope that you take the time at least to get this book if you're a yoga teacher and get some of the foundation basics, if not to prepare for the unexpected, expecting mommy to walk in, which will in all probability happen sooner or later, or to embark on a career in prenatal yoga teacher training. All right, you guys, I am out. Have a wonderful, beautiful day. And thank you, Haley, so much for demonstrating for me. Namaste. You're welcome. Hi, Susan. Uh, we're going to wrap up here, but you can take the next 30 minutes writing up a journal reflection and you can hit up yoga journal. And at Yoga Journal, you can type in prenatal yoga and see some fun things that you can get yourself in trouble with that there. And just type a picture of your work and send it to me as a uh, DM via Slack. And thank you for joining today, my dear. Lovely to see your name. And I know you can't speak or chat because I've got that all off.